Kubernetes. Demo of Ohm's Law for 11th grade. Um, one of the nice things is that I can also take the mathematics that I had in this and I can edit the math. The math, we're using um, uh, technology that allows me to edit the math in different, uh, in two, one of two different codes. Um, let's say that I want to do my formula. Um, uh, I want to do that voltage equals current times resistance. I can switch that here in the, right in my in my document, and I get a live preview. Um, we've, we've done a bunch of testing with teachers that teach math, and in some sense, this is actually more efficient than trying to use a truly WYSIWYG math editor. And of course, we didn't want to spend more time on the math editing than we were spending on the entire editor. Um, and then it has all your, your basic standard things, but not a lot of presentation. Instead of having a lot of fonts and ability to change font sizes, Things are marked up as headings and subheadings, and this is what allows you to build beautiful textbooks, beautiful EPUBs, all of those different formats and have everything look the same. Notes will all come out with nice note formatting. Exercises come out formatted as exercises, et cetera. Okay, my next step is that I'm going to add some metadata to help make sure that this is discoverable, and you can see there's my title. I'm going to say that this is part of science and technology. This is original Sea of Lula content. This is a partner project in South Africa that has open textbooks on millions of students' desks right now. I can add keywords. And then, then the last step is to upload this to an open repository. Right now our tool is connected to Connections, so we can upload this to Connections and publish this content where it can be shared and remixed everywhere. Um, this ability to upload, that just requires a simple um, connection to, a dif to different repositories, what's called an application programming interface. And we have, um, we are planning to hook this up to as many different repositories as we can. Okay, while we wait for that upload to occur, I am going to come back to our talk and continue um, and show you where we're going with that editor that I just previewed. Am I, I need a full screen again probably. Okay. Can you, Ross, can you watch to see if anybody's asking to stop or ask a question? All right. So now I'm just going to zoom through my slide backups of the demo I just gave and talk just a tiny bit about the technical portion of this. Why is this possible? Um, what is making all of this possible is having this content in basically the language of the web. And it's the modern language of the web, HTML5. This is also what's inside EPUB. And, um, it works in browsers, it works on reader devices, it works, uh, and um, you can take that and transform it to PDF to produce print formats. One other piece of this I hinted at when we were looking at the editor functions that we have is that the, the structure of the, the content is kept separate from the style. So what I'm showing here is three different versions of basically the same content and one of them is being shown in connections. One of them is being shown um, on a completely separate site that Siwula has for their South African content. And then the final version is a mobile version that is a stripped down, simplified version that you can even see well on what's called a feature phone. You know those old little flip phones with a tiny, tiny window? They have students that are reading their textbooks on very, very basic phones. And it's all the same content, it's just being styled differently. Now where we're going with this authoring tool that I showed you, uh, I'm now going to demo 
mock-ups, this is a prototype of where we're heading with, um, with the, the editor. And, and we're going to show more of that in uh, about a month, uh, some of the stuff that I'm showing you here as a prototype. Okay, so I'm now just switching to, um, switching to another browser window. Okay, we're good. Um, I'm showing you, I'll just show you the content that we have in this uh, mock-up. We have images, tables, all of the basic things. I'm scrolling too fast. <laughs> okay. Um, and again, you know, showing you that same math editor, all of this part is already live. What we haven't finished uh, with the math editor, which I think is really nifty, is that um, the one complication if you're asking authors to learn a little code where they have to remember that caret is how you do x, you know, raised to the a, is that um, they might forget some of that code. So we have this cheat sheet that comes up at the bottom and you can find, remember how to do those different pieces. So if I've forgotten how to do infinity and an arrow sign, I can look it up below and then use that. There we go. So, of course, that's not mathematically sensible. I apologize to the mathematicians out there. <laughs> I just modified. Uh, <laughs> my, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the other important parts that we're we're doing is making sure that things are that we're being very careful about accessibility. So when somebody adds an image to their document. Um, we, we support adding a caption to that image. So this is, you know, maybe I'm illustrating the industrial process. But if somebody can't actually see that image, I want a description that works for somebody who doesn't see what it is at all that's just describing the image. You know, this is factory workers sewing in an industrial factory. Okay, so I can't type. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'd like to show you something else about this. So I'm actually going to not add that bit of uh, description. I'm going to continue. I also have the ability to help somebody cite something appropriately, which is really great for multimedia that you're adding into your content. So right now I'm just going to say that I own this image and go on. But but if I'm using it from somewhere else, I construct all of that sourcing right here for, and help people do that. But I'm going to insert this image. What you'll see is that I'm doing a little bit of nagging in the editor. I'm telling them that their description is missing. And if I hover over that, it tells them that it's the description for the visually impaired that's missing. And it encourages them just to click and and it, uh, improve that right now. And we're also working with Benetech, Bookshare, and, um, and the Fluid Flow group to make sure that we are giving people support for how to do this well. And so if you click on more info, it goes to some of their content that tells people how to describe these things well. So if I do add this now, which I'm just going to add nonsense text, we're even saying thank you. <laughs> And then the final thing that I want to illustrate here um, is that we are supporting things like exercises and examples. And this is the part that traditionally is hard to do in um, a standard editor. People use fancy structured editors that are hard to learn, that, that support this structure. And we are trying to, as much as possible, stick with um, a very Google Docs or Word-like feel. So if I want to add an exercise to my document, I can type the text of my exercise directly into the document. State the Pythagorean theorem. And then I can add my solutions in here. Now these will be hidden when you actually produce the content, but it gives me a nice way to just do this part right here. Um, and I can then hide that solution. We found in testing that if authors couldn't hide the solution in the editor, they were very disturbed. I can hide and show that solution. 
And if there are some advanced features, we hide that behind a gear. And so all of these semantic items um, operate the same way. And you can move them throughout your document. Um, if I want to add a note to reader, it's showing me where it's legal to put this note so that I'm always respecting the structure of this document. Anyway, um, I think that's, that's basically where I wanted to go. These, these features, uh, some of these features haven't been fully developed, but we're in the midst of getting that ready. And it's all open and, and usable in other people's sites, too. And I'm going to fast forward through that part. So one, just a little bit for any of you who um, are, are working with projects that might be using WordPress or some other different site for, for building content. Um, another piece of this is that there's a real community behind these tools that we're creating. Um, each of the tools is a separate component that can be embedded. The editor is embeddable. It, it's built on a standard web editor. So that, um, and, and we're contributing back. So things like that mathematics editor, that'll become a part of the standard web editor that we're building on because that's useful for a lot of different people. Um, we're working with different projects to, to, to create these tools. Okay, now that I'm going to switch to Ed, who's going to show the power of these, these, this document structure. And these are the, the, different things that Connections creates from this, these simple formats that we're creating. Now, OK, so I want to escape. You can stay, stay there for a couple of slides. Oh, OK. All right, I'll give you, I'm handing you the controls, Ed. OK. Yeah, let's add it to the <laughs> okay. We're going to see if this demo is going to work. So first thing before I started um, showing you the demo is I wanted to talk about some of our content. Um, one of our most popular books is a book called Collaborative Statistics. And it's it's been adopted um, widely and it also has been um, derived, has derived copies in the sense that people have customized it. So if you look at this map, these are where derived copies that we know about are being used um, across the globe. So a derived copy means that some, someone, a professor, has taken the original book, Collaborative Statistics, and they have created their own copy that's customized for their particular class um, or situation. It's, um, it usually involves adding content or removing content. Um, one version, um, they modified all of it so that it um, uses a different calculator in the examples because the particular school had the um, those calculators and not the original calculators in the book. Um, there's, there's also one that uses the content in Clever Statistics to teach the, um, using the language R. Um, so it's, it's, it's the same content. And that's, that's the beauty of Connections is that it's open and you're able to mix things and make it work for your situation. You're not just stuck with the original um, author's vision. And then um, these are, in the US, this is the adoption locations for collaborative statistics. So it's being used in many places. These are, these are the ones that we um, know of. Um, because the way our site works, uh, a professor could be using our book and we would never know because you don't, you don't have to log in to, to view it or download it. Um, you know, your, your class can access it without logging in along with the professor. And so we, we would not necessarily know. But these are the known um, adoptions. And you can see that it's being used um, across the country. So now let's get to the demo. 
and I have to get the camera somehow. Which one's the camera? Is it still running? Is it still running? Close it. Next up. Okay. I saw it over here. Yeah, this one's to them. Okay. I think we may have to switch the sources. Yeah, we warned you guys that we'd have one more technical part. Yeah. I'm oh, showing up as a black square. <laughs> right now. So I'm wondering if we need to switch. Switch what? So go to application okay. sharing and let's see if we need to, because I was sharing Firefox. Oh, okay. Where's that? So that's in Blackboard. So. How do I get there? I don't. Okay. Yeah, I click it and what? It should be the list of things you can share. Hopefully. I don't know whether we need to stop sharing and then start sharing again to get that list back. I have a feeling that's what we're going to have to do. Oops. Application sharing is stop. Okay. So how do I get back to that? Una, can you put us back in the whiteboard again? Maybe it's, see if one of those is the whiteboard. No. Um, yeah, yeah, I put you. Uh, I put you back in the whiteboard. Because we're just once we stop sharing, I put you. I put you back in. The whiteboard. Hmm. You should see okay, the icons at the top of your screen. Okay, we're just looking for that application sharing bit that we can click on. You should see the icons at the top of your screen now. Yeah, that should be right here. Yeah, we're just missing that whole part of the screen. Um. I got wider. I'm drawing. Oh, okay. Okay, that's good. So that's it? Yeah. Now see if it gives us a list. Jeez. There it is. All right. Let me see what over here. Yes. We've got it. Okay. All right. All right, so F11 doesn't seem to be working. It's good enough. It's good enough? I think so. Yeah, it might be faster, smaller too. So it's okay. fine. All right. So, um, so let's um, because we have this open format, we're able to use our contents on many different devices without being without needing to um, change the underlying format. So, let's say you're a lifelong learner. You are using. Um, collaborative statistics, um, you've always wanted to learn about statistics and um, so you're retired and now you're, you've um, downloaded the book and you're using it on your Nook. And this is a chapter in, trying to get it to show up, chapter, this is the first generation Nook and it's using See the refresh is kind of slow, but you can see you can read the book. And you're able to read the contents. You downloaded this for free, just like you would if a student was using it. And you're able to load it on your Nook and read it. And this is a, an older device. It's probably a three-year-old first-generation Nook that we're using. Okay? Some hundred dollars. So let's um, let's say you're a student and you have gotten up early. You know how students love their eight o'clock classes. You um, you went to your eight o'clock class and you're you're back in the dorm and you need to study your physics. Um, and so you're going to use your Nexus Seven. And on the Nexus Seven, you're using the Connections Android app. And so let's go see. We're studying Ohm's law. I don't know if y'all can read that. I think it's okay. All right. Then. Oh, 
hopefully going to load the page. There it goes. So this is um, the content that's in the textbook. You're reading it in the Android app. Um, and then you remember, oh, um, I'm going to be going to that concert tonight. It's in the auditorium, and that, that place is horrible for um, having good Wi-Fi, and I want to be able to study some while I'm waiting. So I'm going to download the EPUB from the Android app. And you can see maybe at the top it says it's downloading, so it's downloaded. All right, so then I'm going to go look at it. And there it is, Ohm's Law. I'm going to open it up. So I'm going to pick this reader and open it. There it goes. All right, so now I have this book downloaded to my device, this chapter out of the book, and I'm able to read it while I'm at the concert without an internet connection. And I can continue my studying. All right, so the same student, um, because they had an early class, it's now lunchtime, so they go in to um, eat lunch, and while they're waiting, they use another connections app called Quiz Cards. What Quiz Cards does is it pulls the glossary terms of a book into the app and creates flashcards. So I've already created a deck. I'm going to choose my deck. And I've picked one for a chapter out of physics called Null Measurements. And um, so I'm going to study. So I'll go slower. So you can see I have the definition at the top, Null Measurements, and then the, the, the term, I mean, and then the definition is below. And then I can move through them. So here's another one, Wheatstone Bridge. So I can read these and, and study them. And so I've read them a few times, so now I'm do, ready to do a self-test. So there's Wheatstone Bridge. Um, I don't remember what the definition is. So I'm going to tap, and the definition shows up. And then I can go to the next one and do the same thing. So you can do quiz yourself a little bit. And then we have a third mode called the quiz mode. And what the quiz mode does is it puts the term at the top and then it randomly mixes up the definitions from the cards with the correct definition. So with the Wheatstone Bridge, let's see how, how good I can get this. Um, let's see. And voltage resistance. I used to know this. Let's try that one. All right. So I'm going to choose next. And you see my score up here? I scored zero. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know that one. All right. I know this one because the definition has the word potential in it. <laughs> so I know the answer to that one. Okay. So, so anyway, that's um. So you can go through and you can test yourself to see how good you remember all of them. All right. And all of this is from the same content. In other words, the the format is the content is stored the same way. It's just um, being used in different devices. So let's talk about an iPhone user. So here's an iPhone 4. And we're going to open iBooks. And if I go back to my library, you can see that I have no measurements, that same book we were looking at um, on the Android tablet. I can open it in iBooks, and I'm able to read it um, on my device in studying. And this is the same same format that we used on the Android. Okay, and also on this device, I can um, show you an example of what Kathy was talking about about Steve Hula doing um, content for a feature phone. So this is Steve Hula's site. Let's see if I can get it. 
focus. And iPhone has a nice small screen so that you're able to kind of see it like a feature phone. Um, but it's, so I'm able to scroll through it. And um, and it's nicely formatted, and I'm able to read it. So, so again, this is the same basic format that's being used on multiple devices. It's device agnostic. It's not we're not customizing it for a specific device. All right. Then the last, uh, we'll show you. I'll show you an iPad. So here's Ohm's law from college physics. One of the Opus Next College books. And you're able to read it. Um, this is the same same thing we looked at on all the other devices. Okay, so um, the the point of showing you all these is to demonstrate that because we're using this open format where we're able to um, do things with it and adapt it. So if, if you have content in our system, we're able to um, create these different, um, create content that's available for these different devices. And um, it also, you don't have to worry, does, your, does everyone in your class have an iPad? Because it will work on whatever it is they have. Um, they don't have to have an iPad. They can have, you know, an X7 or some other um, tablet or just their phone or, or whatever. It will work. And that's what we're trying to accomplish is to make this stuff freely available um, to everyone. Okay. So one of the things we would love to get some feedback and questions for you especially those of you who author open education resources, you know, we're trying to learn. We know a lot of the pain points that authors experience, um, uh, you know, uh, from, from watching Connections authors use some of the more difficult to use tools that were available very early on um, to, to working with uh, authors in projects in South Africa and authors that do book sprints with our uh, partner book type. Um, so we know some of those things that uh, authors suffer through. Um, and also we've done some usability studies on the mock-ups that we've been producing. So again, we've watched you know, what people find easy and what people find confusing and hard. But we'd love to hear from folks who are on the call today, you know, what kinds of things are hard for you and that you'd really like an editor to, to help you with. Um, anyway, so, so I'd like to open it up for people to either IM or, or use the mic and ask a question. And I'm, I'll turn our mic off right now so that we don't get feedback. So, so we have a question about how the editor compares to the iBooks authoring editor from, from Apple. Um, uh, my answer to that would be, you know, we're, we're, we are actually looking at, you know, what they do really well. The, the big difference is that this editor will run in any web browser and it will produce content for any device. So not just the, the Apple, Apple devices. Um. Um, the iBooks author has, um, it's very iPad specific in the sense that it has templates that um, are formatted for an iPad so it doesn't work on any other device. Um, it's also, you're only able to um, import HTML or a Word document. Um, I'm not sure they have a way to edit math. Um, I haven't looked at it since it first came out, so they may have enhanced it. But initially, they did not really have a math editor. Um, so um, it's, 
we're taking the approach that we want to create content for everyone. Um, and Apple's taking the approach of they're making content for an iPad. And that's the biggest difference is that um, so our formats are different than theirs and um, because they have to be um, elastic enough to work on multiple devices and not be device specific. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I want to point out, you know, that piece of it being a community driven project and being com components that can be adapted is that we would love to see other people enhance the editor with with interesting things. One of the things that Jackie mentioned was the ability to comment and share highlights. Um, I think that for students highlighting, that would be where you publish the content. You know, it would be wonderful to have really nice open services where students can, can discuss parts of the book. But in the editing side, you also need that kind of functionality. People want to be able to take a textbook that they're helping to author and while they're on the plane, um, do some editing, do some comments to their colleagues. Hey, I think this example would be clearer if we used the, the terminology that we used from chapter one, or if we were, if we had an example that was a real world example right here. Um, there are some interesting open source annotation projects that um, I'll be talking with later in the year about getting them involved in. Hey, could we enhance the editor with something like that? So. Would love to, you know, that's that's one of the goals is to be able to have this editor evolve with the functions and functionality that people want. Um, my comment on the question about keeping page count low for PWD vendors charging by page. Oh yes. So I guess you know the the point about page counts is really that with an adaptable format that people can edit. You can strip stuff out very easily and create versions for the, you could create a, 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 a smaller print version that just had the really essential content that was maybe more like a reference. And then have your online and iPad and phone versions be, you know, the full all out narrative that's, that's part of the textbook. And, and we're finding with the OpenStax college books that um, the majority of students are not getting a printed copy. So when they're given an option to get an electronic copy, um, they're choosing that over a, a printed copy. I mean, I'm sure cost is part of it, but um, so, so that kind of lowers the concern about page count. Um, the main thing you have to worry about on devices is the file size, the image sizes. How big does the, the file get? But um, so. Ah, uh, yes. Controlling paper is hard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Jackie's pointing out, you know, some some of the automated. So we have this format that you that uh, you can produce all these different um, different versions from. One of the things that Ciavula does is that they have a last step after they've automated. They automate all of their print production. Um, but they do a little bit of adjustment at the very end before they print. If they're going to do, and they do big print runs, they do millions of copies. And so in those print runs, um, they do some, you know, editing of that last step of the format where, you know, like you might have a page that doesn't have enough content on, in it and you adjust that. So again, um, the, the, any kind of automated process will have some infelicities in it and, uh, we're trying to open that process up so that people can build better print pipelines and just attach it to the same content, can, you know, build workflow into that pipeline where you get a copy of sort of like a, a not a final proof, but a pre-proof that you then can adjust before you uh, print. Because those are, those are really important considerations. The, the automated stuff that might be great for all the online versions, you might need to do a little bit of adjustment before you pay that big print run. Yeah, uh, so there's a comment in the chat about the student perks showing a three to one preference for bound textbooks in 2010. 
I have seen a lot of different um, versions. Like I've seen 60% of students wanting a printed copy, 40%, 10%. I, you know, I have a feeling that it, it, it's right now. It's everything is so new. We're seeing rapid changes. It may depend on what the content is. It may depend on how convenient it is to get a print copy. Um, I was wondering that same thing at South by Southwest because I saw like two back-to-back -back talks give wildly different percentages for how many students want print textbooks. And you know, I think I'm just taking all of it with a grain of salt. Like we just don't know the answer there. Right. <laughs> and I'm, I, I can only speak about what, what's happening with Opus Text College, and um, we the the need for for printed books has been less than we anticipated. And Whereas in South Africa with the Seabula project, they have to have print copies. And that, that's their major thing. And then they've got this backup system where students are using their feature phones to read content. Um, and some of the, and, and you know, South Africa has uh, a wide range of, of different students with different technology and, and access to Wi-Fi. So, um, they have to have print for everybody, and then they are building online services on top of that. And, and print is not going to go away totally. It's probably always going to be there. It's just less important. Our next question seems to be, are we open with our spec? <laughs> um, we're very open. It's HTML5. So it's a constrained version of that, and um, in some sense, it's it's as we so the editor is completely open and all of those uh, trans all the transforms that that I showed um, at the beginning with you know Word Open Office those are all open too. Um, I do not think that our documentation is up to standards yet, but we are working on it. So yes, it's absolutely open, and we're we're also looking at what. Um, O'Reilly is doing with their formats to try to make these things as close together and as compatible as possible. So, you know, things like the way that notes and examples and exercises are marked up, all of that is it, it's a fairly simple structure and it's all completely open. And it'll all work in just a regular browser also. So that's important that it is HTML. That's the standard that all of us are moving to um, because then you get, you, you just have a much broader uh, ability to use standard tools. And then we'll, we're working on specialized tools to help people author OER. Yeah. Yeah, and we definitely want others to build editors and content generators around the same spec. That's that's just so key. Yeah. Very, very interesting. That really, really want to support that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Right. Yeah, the ConnectML is well documented, but right, it's we're moving away from that. Uh, one of the, I, I am working with some student interns who are building um, a multimedia button into the editor so that people can easily go and find YouTube videos and um, HTML simulations to include in their content. So that's another thing that I think is really exciting. Um, they are going to have a content sprint in, um, in April with students who will be taking an existing textbook, one of the textbooks that's used in South Africa, and they'll be adding um, simulations and videos from a couple of really, really highly respected sources uh, around physics and chemistry, and they'll be adding that into the content, and then, you know, those, those students will be a part of the, the author page on those textbooks that are on millions of students' desks. So it's kind of cool that these, you know, these senior rights students will both be developers on this open source editor and their friends will be content authors or content enhancers. 
Oh, what are you legacy app questions? <laughs> Jackie Hood. <laughs> Lots of questions? Lots of questions. I'm not sure what you mean by that. To sign a license. It gave you, it asked you to sign a license. It does give you a checklist to make sure you did things, um, but it doesn't stop you from publishing. Um, so I'm not sure what you're you're asking about the questions. Probably, but you know, like in the, the stuff that I was sharing with the diff with the metadata field, we're borrowing a lot. You know, we're trying to learn as much as we can about um, you know which kinds of questions it's easy for authors to answer and which should just have a default answer. Really, the only thing you had to have there was the title. Some of that other stuff that I put in, it'll go through just fine without it. Even with you know the accessibility stuff, we really, really, really want people to create accessible content because that's going to be super important for adoption at the K-12 level for any K-12 textbooks. But we've been very, very careful to not make it mandatory. We might nag you, but we are not going to make you do it because you just can't tell when, when the right time for somebody to add metadata. We know metadata is super important for discoverability, but we don't want to make people, we don't want to interrupt their creative process either. So. We're looking at a lot of those things. Right. And I, a lot of the, I think the new version of Connections will be um, less verbose. So some of that um, text maybe you're referring to will, will be simplified and um, possibly some of it go away. So, um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have our, our email addresses at the beginning. Both of us would be really happy to take more feedback, more questions. If you want to play around with stuff, get involved in any way. Really, really eager to, to bring other people um, yeah, other people into this process. Oh, great. Thank you for being an evaluation subject for us on the editor in Vancouver. Yeah, we are very excited to see at the progress that has been made. We now have this live version that can be used. So it's cool. We learned a ton from doing those, those, uh, those studies in Vancouver. <laughs> anyway. Okay, interesting question there about voice recordings and deltas. Voice recordings and deltas. Yeah. How screwed does uh, voice recordings need to know when ah. information has been derived so that you can redo only the right parts of the voice? Hmm. It's a special case with the translation problem. Yeah, we don't have a way to do that right now. Um, so that's interesting. That's, that's something we need to look into. Yeah, absolutely. I thought of it in the context of, by the way, this is Ross Reesford. I'm also in the room. <laughs> I just can't stop myself from talking. I was recently here for tech support. but uh, um, We thought of that in the context of the uh, translation problem, which uh, where you also want to, if you're keeping a parallel translation of some work, you want also to know just what's changed. Um, and so where we, our derived uh, copies allow for showing linkage, but they don't provide an easy way to show the difference. But the fact that the content is structured does mean that that's technologically not a really difficult thing. The issue inevitably is getting, a, getting it easy to do. In an older version of the connection system a decade ago, we actually had, in fact, the live system still has it, I believe. You can actually look at what has changed in the editor. But you can only understand it if you're a programmer because it shows you a line-by-line -line diff of the, of the structured, structured format. Uh, and it's pretty much unreadable for anyone who yeah. doesn't write their own HTML pages by hand. So it's definitely not a case of ongoing work that needs more user interface and user functionality testing and work rather than technological problems. Yeah, and I, and I was just putting in that um, we're actually going to have an accessibility sprint in San Francisco. Um, we're partnering with Benetech and with 
I think it's IDRC. I can never quite remember their initials, but it's a Yutta Travernas' group in Canada. Oh, she's in Colorado. Okay. Um, and, you know, anyone who's working in that area, I would love to have them involved. We're going to spend the first part of that sprint really brainstorming, especially about how to put tools together. You know, I guess somebody has a tool for doing voice recordings. How do we make sure that it's easy to get between the editor and that tool? Um, people have tools for captioning videos and things like that. And we also want to, we're, we're going to, and then we're going to spend a couple of days with the developers doing some prototyping. Um, you know, none of that, that, that prototyping, the purpose of that is to see what is doable and, and what we should pursue uh, projects and funding for after that. Uh, um, anyway, so super interested. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to folks here and see about that. Is that that's on how to do accessible textbooks. Jackie is saying that Deanza College is having a session. Um, sounds very interesting. Okay, I think we will um, close out today. The slides are available on SlideShare, um, and I'll uh, let's let me see if I can get the link and I think it was click the beginning it. of the chat. Oh, Kathy Fletcher opened the link. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you, whoever put that into the chat. In the third um, and I did as I was going through it. Notice that there are a few typos, so I may upload a correction, but <laughs> it'll be at the same place, same location. And Una, thank you very much for the help, and everybody, thank you for the patience as we got our technical details worked out. Yeah. Thank you.